Any copying, distribution, or public performance of this video or slides is strictly prohibited and may subject the offender to civil liability and severe criminal penalties. The 93rd Annual Meeting of the American Academy of Periodontology Implant Provisionalization A Step-by-Step -step Approach Program Tracks Associate Member Interdisciplinary Therapy Moderator Farhad E. Bolchi Speakers, Harold S. Baumgarten and E. Todd Shire. First of all, I would like to uh, say that I'm very, very pleased to see so many restorative dentists join uh, the Academy of Perio meeting. This um, session this afternoon, as you know, is on implant provisionalization. And obviously, all of you guys are not restorative dentists, but um, you have an interest in this topic um, because of the significance that it has in conditioning soft tissues around implant restorations. And just to give you an outline of the way we're going to um, conduct this program this afternoon, um, we have two speakers, as you know. Um, Dr. Todd Shire will be our first speaker, and he will be uh, speaking mostly on single tooth uh, restorations, provisional restorations, and then uh, Dr. Harold Baumgarten, who is the second speaker, will be speaking of full arch um, provisional restorations on implants. Um, after Dr. Shire's uh, session, we will not take any questions, but we'll just do a relatively quick changeover to Dr. Baumgarten. At, that, at the end of Dr. Baumgarten's um, presentation, uh, we will have a 15-minute question and answer period so that you have the two speakers as a panel to uh, glean more information from. I think that would be the best approach. So if you could hold on to your questions until the very end of the session, uh, it would be very much appreciated. Uh, our first speaker uh, today is Dr. Todd uh, Shire, um, and I've known Todd for a while. Um, I have actually observed him do life surgeries. He's an ex excellent uh, clinician. Um, I don't really know what his excuse is for uh, doing all this restorative dentistry, but I'm sure he will tell us that. Um, but Todd, uh, Dr. Shire graduated from the Commonwealth um, Medical College of Virginia, where he got his dental degree, and then he did his postgraduate periodontal training at the um, University of Texas in San Antonio. He is now in private practice in Houston, one of the uh, premier private practices in the nation, where he practices with Dr. Mike McGuire, and uh, they have a very research based uh, private practice. They do a lot of clinical research uh, in their practice. It's an amazing facility. Uh, I have visited their facility. It's really nice. So um, please uh, help me welcome Dr. Shire. Thank you, Farhad. It's a pleasure to be here. I certainly want to uh, thank um, the Annual Meetings Committee for allowing me to share this information with you. We had a little technical difficulty with the projector, so we've got a few minutes, so I'm going to try to catch up with that in mind. Um, I'm here to talk with you uh, about provisionalization techniques to not only simplify the restorative process for our restorative colleagues, um, but also to optimize the aesthetic outcome. As I begin, I will not necessarily show a step-by-step -step approach. I hope to show you some historical cases to show you where I'm coming from in regards to provisionalization. Uh, and then towards the end, hopefully still have time to, to share with you some really simple step-by-step -step approaches to, to provisionalize either on immediate basis or a delayed basis implants to, to gain the optimal aesthetic outcome. I come to you from Houston where uh, we are sorry that uh, the Astros didn't make it too far, but I'm, I'm from New Hampshire. So last night was a pretty special night in regards to the Red Sox uh, taking the World Series again. So a little lighten the mood a little bit here. We are all um, extremely fortunate to be practicing uh, implant dentistry today where we have such great technological advances um, in guidance, uh, growth factors, piezo surgery. Uh, but today I'm certainly going to concentrate more on provisional loading of dental implants uh, and, and to the term coined by Alan Rosenfeld, collaborative accountability, this whole idea of working with our restorative colleagues and with the patients to fully understand where we're headed uh, towards a final treatment outcome um, through guided treatment planning. I'm not going to have time, nor is the uh, topic today guided surgery. Harold will comment on that today, but we're going to try to keep it mostly uh, focused on the provisional restoration. 
Dental implantology is, is certainly the standard to replace single, multiple, or all missing teeth. Uh, I think today, for periodontists, we have a special opportunity to grab a hold of the, uh, the, the portion of treatment that involves working with the peri-implant tissues to optimize the aesthetic outcome. Uh, we need to set ourselves apart. If you look at the demographics on where we're headed with dental implants, uh, we need to be the premier uh, provider of, of, of aesthetic outcomes and functional outcomes for implants. So I think we have a unique opportunity to, to kind of be the leaders in, in working with, with tissue transitions from an implant platform through these tissues uh, and, and set it up for our restorative colleagues so they can have an optimal outcome. I took a special interest in this uh, nine years ago and, and I've continued to implement this into my own practice and, and, and it truly, uh, I feel, has, has enabled me to, to do things that I couldn't do otherwise as far as rebuilding tissues uh, because of this provisional restoration. But we certainly, we all have in mind goals of function and aesthetics. Uh, and my belief is that with a carefully planned occlusal scheme and using an implant supported provisional restoration, we're going to optimize our clinical success and optimize the outcome for our patients. Um, we know well that, that science has given us the ability to achieve osseointegration uh, and, and maintain bone levels uh, at the junction of, in this case, uh, the rough smooth border. Um, in other cases, uh, actually the very exciting topic that we all hear about, either platform switching or medialization of the uh, connection uh, is, is showing us over time that we can do things uh, beyond what we used to expect of bone loss to the first thread. So the, the science and the predictability is there. What we're going to be focusing on today is the peri-implant tissues and how we can protect those tissues from change over time uh, so that we don't end up with that subsequent recession that can destroy an aesthetic outcome in the aesthetic zone. Certainly, I don't want to leave out all the things that feed into this type of treatment planning process, but we do need to focus uh, on the implant support or restoration. But as you see those cases, uh, I, there was a lot more that went into this uh, between guided diagnosis and treatment, uh, what type of loading protocol was going to be selected, um, the technology at the other end of it to be able to custom mill uh, abutments, either titanium or, or ceramic um, with, with that technology um, and taking into consideration the design of the implant itself and the abutment. We want to start with a diagnostic wax up. You know, this is something I think that some of our restorative colleagues have, have gotten away from. In a single two situation, we, we just don't need to do that anymore. Well, I couldn't um, stress more the importance of this as a roadmap as we get started on this journey uh, of implant reconstructive, be it a full arch case or a single tooth case. Um, you know, this can be our roadmap to success. It can allow us to create scanning appliances. Uh, surgical guides that are going to be necessary to end up with these implants in the proper position. We certainly want to never forget our anatomical landmarks and, and really what we expect uh, in, in the alveolar ridge in certain locations of the mouth is, is difficult. We're challenged by this from the very beginning. So we need to take this into consideration to help us select the proper diagnostic tools uh, to plan for success our classic literature in, in uh, Wheeler's Dental Anatomy. We need to start thinking about the cervical dimensions of teeth uh, at the imp implant platform level as it transitions through the tissue. And there's just a whole bunch of information in the literature to guide us on this as we start to think about constructing a, a well-contoured provisional restoration. In hopes of creating something that looks like a tooth. Uh, and really thinking about this beforehand that we're, when we take a tooth out we would like to place something that, that mimics uh, what we're removing instead of ending up with, with ridge lap situations or overly contoured facial, facial profiles of implant supported restorations. And you know as I mentioned guidance in itself can allow us very simply uh, instead of old more complicated prosthetic treatment planning we can pre-plan with guidance, looking at our scan appliance, and simply sit down with the restorative colleague and make slight adjustments so that we end up with a situation that we're all comfortable with in advance prior to going to surgery. 
This isn't just in the single tooth situation, as Harold will, will discuss, uh, it, it is strongly applicable in the full arch cases, probably even more so in regards to uh, determining path of draw of multiple fixtures to support immediate load prosthesis. And this is what, you know, we, we would like to know in advance before we sit down for uh, extraction and immediate implant placement. We'd like to know where the alveolar housing in reference to that tooth. In this case, a tooth that's been orthodontically uprighted has the apical portion is outside the alveolar housing. And, you know, we need to know these things in advance of treatment. Another strong example of, of root resorption that on a periapical x-ray doesn't have the power of this three-dimensional image that there's really a non-existent root or bone in that location and it's not a case that we're going to be jumping in to place an immediate implant. Again, to avoid the, so to say, um, interoperative surprise or uh, compromised outcome that sometimes we can't recover from other than starting over again, uh, just a few, show a few cases of, you know, what we're trying to avoid uh, as we go through. When we have two implants here, number nine has failed, Number eight it has a one and a half millimeter uh, tissue depth with no running room to develop a, uh, a restoration. Um, you know, with pre-planning, we can avoid outcomes like this. You know, this example certainly, certainly is a testament to integration, but it, it's something that, that we can avoid today. With good planning, these things just should not happen. Uh, fairly easy correction with an angled abutment here, but this shouldn't happen. Another case that, uh, you know, a powerful attorney has something like this occur. Uh, it can be trouble for all of us as implant surgeons today. Uh, a case like this where the porcelain works, looks quite nice, but as you reflect the lip, because this implant was placed slightly facially, subsequent gingival recession has occurred, and this will indeed be a case that's hard to recover from. Another example of just planning uh, deficiencies, leaving an implant, that is non-restorable. And this is a great quote that I often uh, repeat in my memory is, it's not necessarily that we're failing uh, or planning to fail, it's that we're failing to plan. Uh, and with all the advances in, in guidance today, uh, we're blessed with being able to really feel comfortable and confident before we lay our hands to the patient. You know, again, we'll, we'll briefly touch on this, uh, the three-dimensional positioning of what we understand from, from literature uh, on tooth position and, and measurements uh, to the av facial alveolar crest, um, tooth dimensions and cross-section at the cervical level, uh, and then what we can expect subsequently by placing implants, either adjacent to teeth or uh, adjacent to each other. Uh, we've got some, some good basis in the literature to rely upon uh, in planning these cases. Uh, we need to respect biologic width around implants and what's going to subsequently occur to the connective tissue attachment around implants. What is the uh, realistic uh, dimension between the sulcus of an implant and the connective tissue attachment, be it around the abutment or, or the implant itself. And certainly what we're going to expect, not just at one year, but how about five and ten years? Most of this most of us that are doing clinical dentistry uh, plan to be doing it for a long, long time. Uh, and we need to be thinking about our outcomes, not at just at the three and six month mark, but uh, decades or two down the road. The classic literature on, on what happens to soft tissue in the inner papillary area is something that we all know. Uh, well, probably one of the most cited pieces of literature that exists is something that we're, you know, we need to constantly remind ourselves on these relationships, especially when it comes to uh, adjacent implants. And, I think putting this into mind too, that it's not just mesial and distally, we've got to be thinking about this circumferentially around the entire fixture. And the old adage of six millimeters of bone were good for a four millimeter fixture um, isn't necessarily so comforting. You know, with one millimeter bone on the facial profile uh, of a titanium structure, um, after looking at many CAT scans years after placement, very seldom.